The offensive line for the Cleveland Browns is working. Long a liability when it was Joe Thomas and four guys, whoever they could find to yeah. stand next to him. Right. I saw a stat yesterday from Pro Football Reference, I think, that Baker Mayfield had more pocket time than any quarterback in the NFL for week one. Well, what did he do with it? That's a different issue. But they're buying him time. Right. They're opening holes in the running game. And that puts the focus back on Mayfield. When we were working our way through your 40 top quarterbacks, we noticed a dividing line between the guys who can run the play that's called and the guys who have the mobility and the escapability to improvise when the play that's called goes to hell. One thing that stood out to me from Baker Mayfield yeah. as he's trying to will himself to the next level, he's not one of those guys that has enough mobility to keep a play alive, Agreed. to come up with something once the play that's called isn't there. He tries to, yeah. right? Maybe, maybe he wants to be like his good friend Kyler Murray. Baker, you're not Kyler Murray. You're not Patrick Mahomes. You're not Lamar Jackson. You're closer to Kirk Cousins, but not quite Kirk Cousins. But, but, but not even Ben Roethlisberger. He's not able to, to truly make things happen. He want, you can see it in his demeanor. You can see it in the way his body moves. It's almost like he's shocked he can't do more yeah. to get away and make something else happen. But Kevin Stefanski needs to get him to color within the lines quickly yeah, agree. or that passing game isn't going to take off. No, I, I think you're right. Uh, we saw, again, some evidence there on Monday. And, you know, this is where I brought up to Monday to or Sunday we saw evidence. But Monday is where I brought up, you know, I had the same concerns watching that game and even watching back on film is just what do, what is it that Baker Mayfield does great? that you can hang your hat on right now. I, I do. I have a little question there. There's a lot of good, but like the really, really good quarterbacks have some sort of an elite trait that makes them elite in that area along with all their other good. And right now, Baker's not the best decision maker. He's not the most consistent thrower within the pocket, you know, and within that he has moments that lead to turnovers like the interception. Hey, year three, he's throwing a backside slam. It's wide open. It's wide open. He takes a three-step drop out of the shotgun. Three-step game when you're in the shotgun has to be catch it and get ready to throw the ball because the ball travels in the air, which makes up for the first two steps if you were underneath center. He did that. He threw it late. He threw it behind. That led Calais Campbell have enough time to get over there and caught an interception. But that was all Baker Mayfield and his lack of attention or detail to his feet and his technique that way. And they're just you see that on certain throws, too, where you go, man, the guy's open. Oh, he missed it. Um, and then, of course, he's off page with Odell Beckham Jr. and everything like that. So, yeah, a guy that like me who likes Baker Mayfield, I do. And I like some of the things he brings to the table. I, I still am not sure what he is. I don't know yet. I, I don't know. I thought we knew going into last year and last year he made us not know even more. And here we are in week one. It didn't answer any questions, so tonight we do you know a little more digging and hopefully we get more evidence along those lines. And it was a Thursday night in September two years ago when the Jets came to town. Tyrod right. Taylor had the start, got banged up, and Baker Mayfield mania was born. That was it. How do you get back to that? How do you build on that? How do you become the best you can be? And is it possible that the best you were ever going to be is what you were two years ago? It's a depressing thought if it's even remotely true for Baker Mayfield. But, Chris, we have a season and a week of evidence after 2018, and something's missing from the magic that we saw right out of the gates. And yeah. I agree with you completely. When you watch Baker Mayfield play, there's nothing that makes you say, wow. Right. There's nothing that makes you say, damn. There's nothing that makes you go on the edge of your seat and anticipate some sort of magic. It's more like this nagging sense of what's going to go wrong on this play. Oh, they're dropping back to pass. What's going to go wrong on this it play? It is a little. Is you're it right. going to be a miscommunication? Is it going to be a bad route? Is it going to be a mini case of alligator arms? Is somebody going to get their hand in the way? What's going to happen? You know, they fooled Baker Mayfield early on in that game. Calais Campbell dropped into coverage and tipped a ball, and then it was picked off. And I'm sure that was just a product of film study about the tendencies and the tells of Baker Mayfield where maybe he doesn't look – to see if there's anyone in that spot when he throws the ball, and he just throws it. And 
Calais Campbell was well, there yeah. the first interception of the game that opened the floodgates. No, no doubt. And that's that's what I was saying. Like there there was attention to detail with the lack of his drop. You know, he 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 caused that interception. Calais Campbell, if you're the quarterback, was playing right defensive tackle. He was throwing a slant to his left side. It was wide open. There was no linebackers over there or anything. He took extra steps in his drop, which made him late throwing the ball. The guy was open before that for a second and a half already. And he threw the ball, and the ball was going to be behind the, the receiver either. Anyways, if you watch the replay, you'll see the receiver's getting ready to turn his body as the ball is coming in the air because he knows it's behind him. But then Calais Campbell gets his hand out there, and that's what we're talking about. It's just it's rough around the edges with Baker Mayfield right now. You're right. There's some where you go, man, that's a hell of a throw. And then you're going, oh, I don't know what the hell is going to happen here. Whoa, that was a dicey decision. Ah, oh, that ball was a little off target. Oh, I thought he was going to get out of the pocket, but he didn't. He got sacked. It's a, it is. It's a lot of that. So I think when you bring up like his rookie year, the first thing that came to my mind was a guy that got back, you know, dropped back aggressively, made a quick decision, and let the ball go. I see hesitation and thinking in his game right now. I can think of two early throws in this game just this past week where it's like, hey, if you get single, you just throw it to Odell Beckham Jr. And he's got Odell Beckham Jr. two times within the first drive, and he, like, hesitates and doesn't throw it. And Odell's sitting there like, wait, I'm, I'm open. And he's looking around. And he's like, well, why didn't I get it? So I, I do. I get the sense looking at him that he's still a little all over the place mentally flustered, whatever it is, uh, but I would like to see him get it on track because, uh, yeah, I, I, I do think there's potential for the player to be good, and, of course, we know they got some weapons around him. Let me ask you this. Psychologically, yeah. as a quarterback, right. when you are on the first drive of the game and you throw a pass that you believe is going to be open and maybe pop for a nice gain, and it turns out a defensive lineman ends up right in the spot to tip the ball away, does that make you – just like split second gun shy Definitely. after that because you were shocked by the presence of a giant there when you didn't expect him to be there? No doubt about it. It'll make you second guess, second look from that point on because it, you, especially when you throw an interception that early in the game, you just go, okay, man, I threw an interception. You know, first drive of the game. It led to a touchdown for them. You know, you, you just start to go, man, I, I, I don't want to put my team in a hole. One more mistake here. We could be down 14 nothing, and we haven't even, like, broke a sweat yet. So it will make you second guess your throws, what you're seeing. You can become extra careful, which is what I think happened to him a little bit in the first half there. I do, I, and I think that even happened with some throws and things like that to Odell where he just wasn't sure he wanted to let it go because he was afraid he wasn't seeing it right or whatever that is. And, um, yeah, there's been a lot of that. It's just rough around the edges. That's the way I would say it. There's good. Oh, that's nice. But then it's, ooh, yeah, this isn't so good. And it's just never consistent. It hasn't been really ever since that rookie year. How long's his leash, do you think? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Because we know, you and I know, that Kevin Stefanski has great respect for Case Keenum. And we've heard that from many people in the NFL. And they had a great relationship, supposedly, from everything we've heard when they were up in Minnesota. This is the number one pick, but this is a regime that didn't pick him. So that makes the lease shorter than it might have been with a Freddie Kitchens or, uh, of, course, of course, the the head coach that drafted him, who I'm blanking on his name right now, Stu Hugh ja Jackson. Hugh Jackson, excuse me. So what do you think, Mike? I would think if they got to like week six, seven, somewhere in there, and they're two and four, Something like that, I would say that's probably around the time where they'd finally go, okay, maybe we need to sit him on the bench. He needs to take a breather, sit back, reevaluate himself. You know, the game's just become too much. I, I would imagine that. What, what, do you, what do you think? Well, the bye week is always an important spot to yeah. look at. That's week nine. But when I look at the schedule for the Cleveland Browns, right. if we have that graphic, and this is a that, – look at that. That is impressive. The Bengals this week, if they should lose that game, although I don't believe they will if they stick with the running game, it gets a little dicey. Washington, not the Washington of old. At the Cowboys, that will not be easy. The Colts, who knows with them. At the Steelers, then another game with the Bengals and the Raiders before the bye. I could see at some point, if they don't start picking up some wins, if they don't have two wins by the second Bengals game, 
that's when I think yeah. Baker Mayfield's in trouble. But, Chris, here's the thing. It's not just the relationship between Stefanski and Keenum. They have a shared experience from the Minneapolis miracle that I think creates a lifetime bond yeah. and a lifetime sure. friendship. To the extent that there wasn't already a strong friendship between the two men, that moment and that euphoria that was triggered throughout the state of Minnesota, throughout the organization, that creates something between quarterback, coach, and quarterback that isn't going to go away no. in two years. And if and, and, and it was that whole season. It was magical. It was the only year that they worked together in Minnesota, 2017. So I, I think that, that from the moment Case Keenum was added by the Browns, the seed was planted of the possibility of an alternative to Baker Mayfield if he skews toward the Baker Mayfield of 2019 – not the Baker Mayfield of 2018, and I don't think we should be surprised if it happens. And I think, and look, I, I don't want to go any farther than the surface of this rabbit hole, Chris. Yeah. And I'm reluctant to even bring it up. But conspiracy Mike on a Thursday morning would say to you that Baker Mayfield's about face on kneeling for the anthem was influenced in part by the fact that he knows he needs the fans on his side. Because once they turn on him, it is going to be Case Keenum time. Uh, I agree with that. I do. I think that that was a business decision to realize, like, wait, I'm kind of on the fence right now here in Cleveland, Ohio. And let me just stand up and not be a distraction or cause any noise or have people, you know, apt to jump on me a little quicker because of this. Uh, I agree. I, I do agree with that. I think he assessed that situation and knew that it would probably cause more harm than good for himself and maybe the team altogether. I don't know. Maybe he just didn't want to deal with that in the conversation there. Uh, and I understand that. I mean, they're a team that's got enough things going on. They've accomplished nothing. And, you know, stay the course. Just worry about what you got to worry about right now. I, I respect Baker Mayfield's stance on a lot of this stuff. I do. Uh, I know he's, you know, in the good fight for social justice and everything like that. Um, but this is a big year for him and his career. And you're right. With Case Keenum and Stefanski, that is a special bond. They did special things that year and it almost had a special ending. The M Minneapolis miracle, like you said, was special. Uh, and, and I think that's like we, you said, that second Bengals game. If they go into Pittsburgh and lay an egg offensively and it doesn't look good, and they're sitting there two and four, and their only wins are maybe tonight and maybe the Washington team. I think Cleveland will sit down and have serious discussions about, oh, what should we do with Baker Mayfield? Is it time to sit him down? How much longer do we let him go? And I think that all will start up. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.